You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby DIY Musician Welcome to episode number 85 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin, and joining me for this roundtable edition is Chris and The Bolt. Hello. Bolton. The Bolt. <laughs> <laughs> Never gets old. No. <laughs> At least for us. Our, That's right. Our audience is <laughs> bored to tears. Everyone else is rolling their eyes right now. Right, right. Um, so, how you guys doing? Everything going well? Pretty yeah, well, I think uh, it's going great. Have I talked about going to the Folk Alliance Festival? No, you have not. That's you should probably give us a give us your one minute update on the Folk Alliance. It was fun. It was in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, basically there were three thousand folk musicians and industry types all squeezed into this one Marriott hotel and uh, nonstop music and panels and discussions and concerts and all kinds of craziness from about 9 a.m. till 4 a.m. every single day for five days in a row. Wow. Came back exhausted, but it was it was pretty inspiring and really awesome to see talented musicians just busting their butts, Very cool. making good things happen. And I should mention that uh, we have the CD Baby YouTube channel, which is going to be, uh, we're going to be posting some videos that you shot at the Folk Alliance. And there's one already up there. It's very... Yeah. Very impressive. Yeah, we did. Uh, CD Baby hosted three nights of showcases on the 17th floor in a little hotel room with no PA. And basically people would just come in and do half hour sets, acoustic singing into the air. And I, I uh, yeah, recorded it for video and audio. Awesome. Yeah. So we'll be posting some of those video snippets. So you can find that at youtube.com slash CD Baby video. Um, they'll be trickling out there. And if you listen to the folk podcast uh, that Peter hosts. He's been uh, using the audio that you collected and putting together some special editions of that with lots of more live uh, audio from that night. So worth checking out. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I've got a couple quick little programming notes, if you want to call it that. Um, (laughs) Things I thought I should mention. I've noticed with the new iTunes uh, with lately, I think with starting with version nine, that if you subscribe to podcasts, it'll stop updating your podcast just after missing four episodes. So if you don't update your iPod um, and there's been four episodes, it'll stop downloading them. And the only reason I thought I'd mention this is because several people have emailed me saying, why have you guys stopped putting out episodes. And I'm like, we haven't. And then I've noticed that it really comes into play if you listen to podcasts that are daily because you miss, you know, I, I update my, my iPhone like, you know, twice a week. So podcasts that I listen to are daily. It keeps unsubscribing. So if anyone knows a way around that, how to fix that, please share because it's really annoying. But uh, <laughs> we're still producing podcasts. And some of the, some people have asked if we do them weekly or bi-weekly or why sometimes we skip a week. Um, the one thing we've noticed is that the majority of people download the podcast between Monday and Wednesday. So if we're kind of lagging behind and not going to get a podcast posted till Wednesday night, we just figure we'll wait till the next week. That way people don't miss it. So that answers that question. Oh, you know, I should give a special shout out to some podcast listeners that I met at Folk Alliance. You should. Uh, this band called Battle Victorious. and. Nice. Uh, Good name. A, a folk name, a folk band called yeah, Battle Yeah, folk duo. Vic- they, I think they live in Memphis, so they figured they'd check out the, the what do you call it, the festival, the, the conference. Uh-huh. But um, I was in the showcase room, and someone else I knew walked in, and I said, hello. That's all I said, just hello, or, you know, hey, how's it going? And this one little sentence that I said, the person sitting in front of me turned around and says, you're Chris from the podcast. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I was like, wait, you, you really just recognize my voice from saying hey what's up and yeah he says that he works in a warehouse and he listens to this podcast non-stop so like my voice is 
It's like his, the voice of his mother or father. It's just, wow. You're very comforting. Comforting, I know. Wow. I asked him if I, if he thought I came off as the curmudgeon of the group. And he's like, no, you seem nice. Ah, well, we're not painting you correctly then. I know. <laughs> well, if they could see the, the new uh, facial attire you're wearing. Yep. yep. <laughs> February was grow your beard out month. And then at the end of it, you're supposed to shave it down to a mustache. So I did. Oh, nice. Isn't there a mustache like, like night at one of the bars here in town? Probably I is. I think there is like a mustache party or something. I think that's just one of those uh, things the cops set up to go round up all the, <laughs> <laughs> the criminals. <laughs> yeah, same experience when I called, you know, the previous episode, which we're going to recap in a bit, where when I called Lisa Lynn to interview her for the, the podcast, um, when I answered the phone or when she picked up the phone, she's like, oh my gosh. You're actually talking to me, directly to me. <laughs> she listens not to the listening to the radio. The <laughs> so we're glad we can have such big influence on yeah, your life. And that we're famous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our small voices make a big difference. Yes. Before we get to the news, I, there was something that I saw, an interesting promo item a, a band called The Boxer Rebellion was doing. I thought I would share um, just quickly. Uh, they have this thing on their website. I need to find out who's powering it, but where you can download like their previous EP for free. They've got a new album out that uh, is doing quite well. And when you download it, you could, you know you obviously give your email address. After you download it, they send you an email that's this cool little like web page looking thing that if you've bought their most recent album by clicking on the link, if you say, yes, I bought it at iTunes, somehow it checks your iTunes library and knows that you got it legally and it opens up to all this uh, extra content, like oh, wow. uh, extra videos and audio content and all sorts of stuff. And I just thought that was a really cool idea because uh, probably next week, the episode is going to feature an interview I did with Chris Anderson, who wrote um, the book Free, and he wrote Long Tail. I'm definitely excited for, about that one. Yeah, it's a good great. one. And you can get Chris Anderson's book for free in the podcast section of iTunes, in the audiobook section of iTunes. It's in both um, for free. And uh, yeah, so I thought it was cool that this band uh, kind of timely sent me this thing where it's like um, they gave me their old EP for free. Got my email address. Then they sent me something that if I'd purchased their new album, which it tells you about the album, so it's not assuming you did, but if you did, and it it verifies it with iTunes, and then they give you all sorts of other content. So it's kind of a cool idea of they gave me something free, they encouraged me to buy their latest release, and then in doing so, I would get all sorts of other stuff. So if you download Chris Anderson's book and listen to it before the interview next week, that'll get... uh, I think some good conversation going and about ideas like that and I'm sure some people are going to be mad about some of the conclusions of this interview and some people are going to be excited and take the ball and run with it so I'm looking forward to see how people respond to that so that's uh, next week hopefully so uh, what do you say we get into some news let's do it CD baby CD baby music music news news Watching music videos is still the most popular activity on YouTube, according to research company Sosomis. Music videos account for 30.7% of all views. The study also shows that 20 to 35-year-olds are the primary drivers of YouTube traffic, and embedding and linking to videos on social network and blogs by fans 20 to 35 accounted for 57.3% of all YouTube links. We mentioned in a previous episode that Rock Band was now allowing artists to do the needed work in order to make their song available in the Rock Band store, which will be launching very soon. Well, Brian Hazard wrote an interesting article about his whole process of getting approved on the Rock Band store. You can find the article at musicthinktank.com. And his basic conclusion is that it probably wasn't worth the time and effort. So if you're a band or artist who thinks your music would do well on that platform, I highly suggest reading the article so you'll know exactly what you're getting yourself into. In the end, it might be easier to just pay someone to do the work for you. And uh, I'll put a link to that article in the show notes for this episode at cdbabypodcast.com. Web analytics firm Compete.com reveals that there has been a major shift at the top of the web charts. Facebook is now larger than Yahoo in the U.S., Yahoo for years was the world's most popular website. However, two years ago, Google passed 
Yahoo and became the internet's most popular destination. Last month, it became Facebook's turn to pass up Yahoo and make it the number two most visited site in the U.S. And there seems to be no slowing to Facebook's popularity. So is it possible that Facebook will overtake Google? We'll see. And finally, those of you eagerly awaiting the Apple iPad, they announced that it will officially be available on April the 3rd. So all of you eager to rush out and buy an iPad, you can get it then. And we want to hear the first one of our listeners who gets an iPad. We'd love to hear from you. Give us a call and and tell you what you think. Yeah, it'd be cool to get some um, reviews and uh, first thoughts from the artist community to see if, you know, you think it has value to... Um, to, you know, some future ideas of what uh, can be done to engage people with content. Well, well, what I'm thinking is that I'm going to get an iPad, take some duct tape, tape it to my chest, (laughs) and, like, play, like, like, a movie when I'm on stage of, like, I don't know, like our music video or something like that. Um, Or, I don't know, just, you know, people partying or something. Just turn it up a notch, you know, get creative. Make sure it's powered, you know, get plenty of battery power before you... Yeah. Regardless of whether or not you use it live, if you get one, you should tape it to your chest, otherwise you'll lose it. (laughs) (laughs) The rock band thing I was thinking is pretty much exactly what I predicted. You know, or at least from that one guy's experience, just a lot of work and and cost and labor and not much return on it. And uh, Brian, his band, I believe his band's Color Theory, they sell through CD Baby. He's written a bunch of articles that are good for independent artists. But uh, yeah, it, the article is really in depth about like what you have to do and kind of what he knew going into it. And it still was a lot of work and trouble. And if it's something, a project that you just want to undertake um, and have, you know, some programming capabilities, it's, you know, go for it. If you're, uh, you know, the average artist who doesn't really want to put the effort in, but thinks your music might do well in that platform, there are some companies that you know will do it for you. I've heard everything ranging from like three fifty to a thousand dollars. So, well, yeah. I mean, if you think you can do it and you have some capital, that's not horrible. It's not what they were predicting the uh, the iTunes album page would cost. What yeah. was it ten thousand dollars or something? <laughs> they still deny that. Right. Right. <laughs> well, let's move into uh, our recap of last week's episode where we talked about strategic partnerships for your music. I thought it was a good episode and, and it definitely got uh, got the creative juices flowing with what uh, I could do with the music I'm working on. And what were you guys' thoughts, comments? I know our listeners had some good thoughts and comments. My thoughts and comments were, how the hell does any of this apply to me? How Not, not how does it, but how can I make it apply to me? How... Because I feel like my music is a little bit uh, angular and threatening for the normal, you know, like family audience. Well, you add that mustache, and it's definitely and it's threatening. It's a little more threatening, right? <laughs> I mean, not like it's it's not like death metal or anything, but no. you know, it's it's a little bit skewed for the normal pop audience, and it's maybe not arty enough for the avant garde type, uh, you know, people. It's it's not really super indie. It's this in-between line, and I'm sort of trying to figure out what companies well, what's, you could pair with. To, well, what's, one of the, what's a band you'd compare your music to? That's a great question. I, maybe John Vanderslice? Okay, I'm not as familiar um, with John Vanderslice. Give maybe, me another one. Um, <laughs> I've heard of you 2 and Radiohead. Do you sound like them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the Beatles. Okay. I sound exactly like okay, all three perfect. of those bands. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure. I'll have to think about that. I mean, I did see you guys play a long time ago, but I don't know how much has changed. I don't know either. That First of all, that's an important first step, figuring that out. I know that you know both Steve with his band Hullabaloo and Lisa Lynn ended up doing something that catered more towards, well, one was kids and then one was, you know, babies. But I think in the end, that's not really how you should look at the partnership it was just something that enhanced their product where um, the thing I like about Steve's story is he went out and kind of engineered it himself. You know, he kind of realized, Hey, I'm already working, playing with these kids and uh, you know, for this company, maybe there's some bigger opportunities there where with Lisa, it was literally, she listed it on CD baby and somebody found it and wanted to pair it with their makeup that they put out. Um, and I think the important lesson is just, you know, figuring out 
just thinking outside the box of where you might fit and beyond, you know, because you're probably thinking, what company? He did, you know, he's doing kids music. It's a kids company. But, you know, I was just thinking back how we, Hello Morning, played at a clothing store here in town called the Lizard Lounge, which carries really cool clothing. And they do like a monthly in-store where they have a band and free beer and, and they pack the place out. And uh, it's, you know, the audience is more, you know, their target audience is probably mid thirties, you know, it's people that got money to spend on nice clothes and they do these big email blasts that, um, are really well done and don't just talk about the, the clothing or what's new and stuff. They have like editorial content. And I thought, well, that might be an opportunity to say, Hey, we've played in your store before and we'd be willing to give away our EP for free to your audience. And is there some sort of partnership there? So, I mean, it's not necessarily, you know, our music and your music would fit as well. Well, I think that having edgy music is a big selling point. A lot of people are looking for edgy music. Maybe not kids, you know, maybe not moms and dads for their kids, but like there's a lot of a lot of kids out there with credit cards who like edgy, weird music. But I think it might be, t- I guess my point was it. it's a little bit tougher to visualize what kind of company is going to feel safe uh, getting behind that and partnering with someone who's got well, profanity think, in their lyrics or like, you know, right. You should be ashamed of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, I'm like 75% clean <laughs> bars, venues, alcohol, cigarette companies. Well, I mean, that, I, no. Ooh, perfect. Yeah. Drug cartels. <laughs> Drug cartels. <laughs> That's who I need to pair. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they do need to some, some customer outreach. Awesome. <laughs> no, but Pimps. I think, I think the, the thing that that clothing store Um, What they try to do with their emails is they really try to position themselves because it's this brand. There's one of the main brands they sell, they actually make. And they really try to position themselves as a Portland company. And a lot of the editorial content they they write is about, you know, kind of the Portland Northwest kind of lifestyle. And I think you take that and you go, okay, you know, they're not doing it now. But I thought about the idea of pitching them like, hey, it'd be cool if you featured a Portland band and that would be willing to give away their EP to all their, your, your email list, that kind of gives you more flavor of Portland and it's an opportunity for the band to get their music out. Your customers get something free and find your emails more engaging. I don't know. I still haven't really figured it could, out how to It could always pitch. be the band that's going to play the next month so that their, yeah. their audience has downloaded the music and then comes to see them or something yeah, like that. Yeah, something like that. Or, you know, there's lots of companies that are trying to brand themselves as being from a town and one of the best ways to do that is music and I think that's where there's a big opportunity for people to look. You you know um, it just reminds me a friend of mine did product placement for movies um, for a while where she basically would negotiate between companies and movies to get the products placed in scenes. She did stuff like placing things on the set of an X-Files episode and stuff like that but what she would do is she would walk through the mall and she would read these scripts, you know, so she'd have like five scripts swirling around in her head and she'd walk through the mall and she'd look at all the products and she'd be like, how can I pair like this script with what product? Or how can I pair this product with this script? You know, like how can I find a way to like get these two things, this art and this product into business together? And I think that you could do kind of a similar thing. I don't know if walking through the mall is it, or maybe <laughs> maybe walking through your downtown, you know, and and being like, like where, you know, who could I partner with? It's not going to be something that every band wants to do, and some people may have objections to it, as far as like partnering with a company with their music. But you know, there's there's big deals out there, but there's also a lot of small deals that could be easily made. Where you know, just having your music on a, a company's website you know in the background and then here the music on this website is so and so a lot of times you see benefit concerts which are you know whereas maybe as a band you're not making a ton of money maybe but you can get like say hey i'll help you guys raise money i'll you know i'll bring in the music you guys pay for the hall like you end up arranging a big event where you get in front of a whole bunch of fans for a good cause and a lot of your expenses are paid for by by the companies that you partner with yeah that's definitely something to think about if you're if there's some organizations that you feel strongly about especially if they're local and just keeping tabs on the kind of events they do a lot of times you know there might be a, a partnership opportunity there where you're helping out a cause, you know, by playing for free and they're putting you in front of a much bigger audience. And I actually did that with 
um, this other artist I play for back in last December, and uh, the, it was a packed room. There was probably around a thousand people there. They actually did pay us a little bit, but he sold a ton of CDs because that kind yeah. of audience, it's like they see you play, you know, it was the kind of audience that has money and they sold a ton of CDs. Yeah. So that's always... Getting in front of a jazzed audience that likes your music, you know. Is or a captive audience. A captive <laughs> audience, that too. Does that mean you're supposed to lock the doors? Yeah. <laughs> Leave the fire exits open. <laughs> Be like the end of uh, Inglorious Bastards. Have you seen that movie yet? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have not. It's well worth it. I'll, I'll have to see it. I was going to say with, with Lisa's story, the thing that I found interesting, um, and I always tell artists that, you know, even if you've got your whole like mail order thing going on your own and um you know we've talked to david nevue in the past where he does a lot of it himself right. he uses cd baby for digital distribution it's still good to have your album listed with a company like cd baby because we do get tons of people coming here who are like i need you know an album for this type of thing and a lot of people will think well they'll just go to itunes but itunes once you get beyond their main pages if you don't know what you're looking for you really can't browse it's, you can't search by subject or anything like that. I mean, it's not a great search engine. No. And so people just kind of assume, well, I'm in iTunes, they can find us. But a lot of people will go to cdbaby.com and start searching by moods, by various keywords. And I've seen a lot of artists get uh, deals because of that. And um, whether it be film and TV, whether it be partnership type things. And people will just type your name straight into Google. And the more the more presence you have on different websites, the, the more likely you're going to come up. Yeah, and that's one of the things that um, in the past, iTunes did not come up in searches. And right. I, they're working on making their catalog on the web. And now that they're with partner, they own Lala.com, I'm sure... All that will be changing very yeah, soon. Yeah, I've seen some of those web pages now come up, the iTunes ones. Yeah, you used to get a blank white page that says, we're opening iTunes. Yeah. Now you actually get the album page, and it still opens iTunes. Yeah. But yeah, people will do searches, and CD Baby always ranks really high. I think and, I, I've mentioned this before, I think, but my wife uh, works in film and video, and on the last four or five movies that her company has made, there's always a CD Baby artist in there because she likes going to our search engine and just typing something in that keyword search and, you know, something like Lonely Cello or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, and then she's always found some really great music and it's affordable for that company to use because it's indie artists. They're not going to charge them a million dollars for yeah. their song or something. But You know, artists call us all the time saying, what, what can I do to help improve, you know, my CD Baby sales? And a lot of times we'll go look at their page and they'll have no style description. They'll have like one sentence bio. We're from so and so, Texas, or something like. Yeah, it. Just be right. something, you know, very simple. And then they're they're wondering why no one's finding their page. And it's not just for sales, um, but like we're saying, just in Google searches in general. And I think a lot of times artists think we're just giving them a line. Yeah, you need to fill out a better style description and a bio. But I mean, that really is stuff that's the that's indexed by Google and our search engine and. That's how we see people getting found every day. And so, I mean, if that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so with Lisa's story, you know, she had her old thing going and then she listed on CD Baby and someone was specifically looking for that kind of album. And also the other thing that I liked about her story is that it wasn't her main thing. So she wasn't really sure she wanted to put that album out there. But, you know, in my opinion, if you've got recorded music that, you know, you're distributing publicly somehow i think it's worthwhile making it available everywhere just for this kind of instance yeah. but and she got to buy a house yeah she bought most importantly yeah <laughs> and again i mean in both these examples um it's that niche they both found you know a profitable niche i, I think that they found a specific sort of need for a specific kind of music i think that you know the stories kind of reminded me of like dan zane's and um and roofs and Roos, right. I think that if you do, maybe if you're, you know, maybe your your calling isn't um, wedding music or, or um, kids music or fairy tales, uh, or sorry, fairy tales. Fairy tales. <laughs> fairy tales. What am I talking about? Fairy tale weddings? Fairy tale wedding singers. Um, <laughs> you know, like, try try something a little bit different. You know, so if, you, if you can do it, like, you can, you know, if you can make your bread and butter, like, doing something that's not exactly your your calling you might be able to support what you're trying to do 
on the side. The whole like reason I called Lisa was about you know that big makeup company that wanted to pay a lot of money to license the album. But I thought what she was doing at the hospital that kind of led to the creation of that album in the first place was just as interesting where she had started playing at the hospital and they were paying her to play. And then from that point, she thought, oh, or from that point, they asked her to make just that little, you know, like 30 second recording that they could right. play. I just picture this giant button, baby born, push the button. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, from that point, you know, she's like, huh, I should just make a whole CD. And then the hospital, she said, buys about 200 copies a month. Whoa. And so that right there is a, a good steady income that's just one hospital and you know she said she had tried to branch out and do more hospitals but um the fact that they're such a pain to get to pay you know she said she has to chase them down that she didn't want to mess with chasing down five ten hospitals but uh yeah i mean just thinking about you know she plays the harp obviously it's soothing they're not going to let a heavy metal band go into the hospital and Give all, send all their patients into <laughs> cardiac arrest. <laughs> but there's lots of artists outside of just a harp that that scenario I think would apply. I know the hospital that um, near my house has this giant lobby that's that's separated from where the rooms are, and there's this enormous grand piano in there. And I'm sure that they probably pay somebody to come in and play. And then it just leads to opportunities. So I think that's it's a good example of how they made the first step of just being around a place of business and both in both cases. And then from that point, they started making connections and rela- building relationships. And then one led to a direct relationship with that company and one led to the creation of an album that another company wanted to, to license. So I think that was just kind of the seeing how everything unfolds. It's not like you just go knock on the door of a CEO's office and say, partner with me in my music. Right. There was you look some... for the little opportunity. The little opportunity breeds a medium opportunity. The medium opportunity breeds a bigger opportunity. And eventually you've got something kind of cool. But, you know, it doesn't always just fall in your lap. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, well, let's get to uh, the calls and your feedback. We've got some good ones. CD Baby Podcast. Message line 206 426 The number you have dialed 206 426 5683. CD Baby guys, enjoy your show. Quick comment about the i5 Dragons guy. Um, it sounds like he took a real market research formulaic approach uh, about the kind of music he creates. Uh, Got researching the market and then creating music that he felt matched the market. At least that that's the vibe I got out of the conversation. And Kevin, it seemed like you didn't challenge him on that point. You kind of tended to agree with him on that. And I know you don't really feel that way. And maybe I misinterpreted it, but that's the, that's the vibe I got out of that comment. Also, I didn't think he was very loyal to his investors who had put money in for a guaranteed uh, catalog. And he seemed to say, oh, that's a gray area. We'll, we'll hope the, the record label, uh, you know, we, we trust the record label. They'll take care. You know, we think they'll take care of it. Uh, the way he just talked it up as a gray area, I, I thought was not a good sign. Last comment, I listened to the song at the end, and, you know, it did really sound quite formulaic, uh, I'll have to say. Uh, very poppy, super poppy, objectionably poppy at the beginning and end with a little bit of a power chord, uh, you know, uh, chorus. A little bit of a rocky, but not too rocky, kind of safe, uh, limpy, wimpy, rocky kind of chorus. It did not seem very real to me. So I thought the guy had some great marketing ideas, and, and he seems like a real personable guy, but a little bit too calculated by half. That's my vibe about him. Okay, thanks. Take care. Hey, this is Dave King from Connecticut. I'm a regular listener of the uh, CD Baby podcast, and uh Enjoy every episode that comes around. Um, I had a quick question. I was listening to the uh, most recent episode with the guy from I Fight Dragons, and he mentioned a thing where he said that through their website, um, they don't just let people download uh, music without um, providing like an email address first or something. And 
I have a website, and I provide a lot of downloads, but, you know, there's no catch to it. People can just download the songs, and um, it's as simple as that. So I was kind of wondering if you guys knew how to um, set something up so that, you know, to get a download, it would require, you know, providing a, a email address or something like that first and how that would work. And maybe uh, maybe there's some service out there that provides that. So anyway... That's my comment and question. Uh, once again, Dave King from DaveKingMusic.com. And uh, keep up the good work. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you for those calls. Honesty. Yes, he was very honest. <laughs> Don't hold back. <laughs> Don't hold back. <laughs> Called me out. <laughs> Actually, he didn't leave his name. He didn't leave his the name. The first guy. Yeah, the first guy. And, you know, I see what he's saying. I don't think he was necessarily being, like, creating music, going, this is the kind of music that will sell. I think they just are play poppier music and you know there's certain music that once you get into the world of pop it's going to sound somewhat calculated because pop music is that way. I think that everybody who has ever written a song has had that idea in their head uh, that they would be famous that they'd be playing in front of a huge group of strangers you know like I don't think that's that's a necessary vision but I think that like we're all uh, you know sort of susceptible to that and I think that um, maybe some people are a little bit smarter about making it actually happen than others <laughs> yeah well and you know if it's something where you just it sounded like he didn't like the music in general so you know it just depends what you like you know some people that's just the kind of music they create I, you know I'm sure he had I don't know my conversation with him because I think I talked to him for a little bit while longer uh, we're talking about Brian from I Fight Dragons uh, when I interviewed him, I talked to him a little bit longer than what you heard on the recording. And it didn't seem to me like he was doing something like that was just totally fabricated. It didn't seem like that. But, but it did sound like he knew what the trends were and he knew that he was taking those trends. You know, he was taking the trend of 8-bit, you know, mm -hmm. music and, you know, adding sort of popular punk you know, elements and he knew that he was making a recipe that he thought would be successful, you yeah. know, like, and I think that, you know, I mean, one of the reasons why we had him on this show is because he was doing the right stuff, you know, <laughs> like he was being successful in, in his marketing plan. Yeah. It struck me like they loved playing it. And then once they realized that it, I think you actually called it a gimmick at the, in the yeah. interview, right? Once there was the, the gimmick was sort of out in the open they said, well, let's roll with this and let's stick with it because it's working. But I don't think they ever didn't, they did it because they enjoyed it at first, you know, and then it was like, yeah. we're good at this. Yeah. If you're really trying to sell commercial or sell music commercially, like, you know, put it out there, have people buy it, get fans that are excited about what you're doing. There's an element of understanding what people are going to want to hear that you're I always mean, putting and into it's, it. And it's, you know, and we come back to this again and again and again. It's the story. Like, if between a band, if you had to go, you know, you had to go out to a band to see a band tonight, and one was described to you as like, you know, like cool poppy punk music, and the other one was cool poppy punk music that uses Nintendo controllers in their songs. You're gonna go see that one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> On the flip side of this argument is, uh, I just heard. I think bands probably say stuff like this all the time, but you know that band Phoenix. Yes. That uh, they just you know within the last year year and a half came out with that their most recent album, which has done I think way more way better for them than any of their previous recordings and. They were doing okay, but they weren't weren't household names or anything. Then they made this record supposedly without any thought of fans or influence or like how people are going to receive it. And they said this was the first time they'd ever recorded uh, kind of in a vacuum and, and they really wanted to just make the music that they were geeking out on and really got into and almost intentionally tried to make something that they thought people would maybe be indifferent to or wouldn't have a strong opinion about, and then here it blows up. So in the opposite but argument... I don't is, know if I buy that story. <laughs> I don't know if I buy it either, but it's a nice romantic rock and roll yes, vision. Yes, it yeah. is. And I think lots of bands say that kind of stuff all the time. But. They do, but I think also, this could start a whole other conversation, but I think a lot of times, sometimes when bands say that, that they're just going to do like what they geek out on, I think sometimes that can almost be more derivative of other stuff because they're kind of just like going with, you know, I don't know, really just tapping into what's influencing them at the mm -hmm. moment, which can right. be some very popular music. You right. know, I don't know. That's a whole nother podcast. That's a series yeah. of podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the second caller, David or Dave King, mentioned giving away download without uh, getting an email address. Um, there are some uh, services that'll do that for you. One that I've been using with my band because CD Baby is 
hopefully developing one soon is well list baby can do it we can do it with list baby with uh, host baby right currently right now you can mm-hmm. i did not know that yeah. does it work with any website with that if you have a website on um on host baby um we can help you set it up just give us a call okay for those of you non-host baby people get on host baby but um, <laughs> after that uh, company i've been using that's uh free is called fanbridge they do email list because list baby is still only a host baby client vehicle and soon it will be available for everyone so then right, at that right. point it's going to be a new list baby coming out that's going to be killer <laughs> but uh, so i've been using fanbridge they've got a little tool that allows you to put in give away a download for an email address and so yeah that one's that one seems to be working good we should move on because i've got one more call hello this is tor christensen big fan a singer songwriter from iceland living in canada regarding uh recording covers uh, we all know it's a it's a hassle i was wondering could it be a win-win for everyone to uh uh for cd baby to offer cd baby customers uh, to take care of paying the Harry Fox agency, their share might be more money for everyone. Uh, I understand that the uh, the agency already has an online form, so they have streamlined the process. They would streamline it even more to have, you know, uh, if you wanted to record a, a cover, you would only sell it on CD Baby, and you would send uh, whatever is sold, uh, send their share to, uh, to the agency. Um, just an idea. Maybe it's crazy. Uh, anyway, I'm a huge fan of CD Baby and DIY podcasts. You know, they're one of my bright spots in the world of DIY music uh, distribution. Of course, uh, you know, other companies are now trying to steal us away from you. But um, I think, you know, the philosophy and the and the attitude still maintain is a, is a huge source of, uh, of loyalty for me. So keep up the good work. Uh, my name is Tor Christensen, uh, torchristensen.com. And, of course, um, you can find me on CD Baby. Thank you very much. Bye. Well, you're in luck. We do have a deal currently in the works with a company called Rights Flow. And uh, we're going to be doing that directly from uh, CD Baby, hopefully very soon. I keep being told it's launching any day. So, yes, we are going to do that where you can uh, sign up a cover song and then just um, deal with the mechanical royalties and the digital download royalties, DPDs they like to call them, uh, right from CD Baby. There's a link in your CD Baby member account right now that'll take you to an affiliate page um, where you can do that. But uh, soon you'll be able to do that right from your CD Baby member account. So I'm sure we'll be sending out an email blast when it happens. Those are the calls. And if you'd like to call a listener in line, it's 206-426-5683. We love getting your calls and playing them on the podcast. I've got a couple quick comments and emails. Um, Darren Riley, who likes to post on the comment section at cdbabypodcast.com, wrote, Interesting episode. Lisa's tale was particularly fascinating as ultimately it sounded like she wasn't too happy with the way things went, even though they obviously went very well. Likewise with Steve, I guess, although the campaign was doing okay, it sounded like it wasn't doing as well as he had hoped. I think, though, that Steve's previous campaign had a lot to do with the time of year. And uh, he starts talking about his band. We've sort of got a loose partnership with a British microphone manufacturer called Newman Retro. It's nothing special and certainly not a business agreement, but we used one of their microphones during the recording of our EP, Five Songs for Oscar, available at CD Baby. We let them put a track on their website to demonstrate the mic and hope that we got some fans that way. Likewise, I mentioned them on our Facebook page and will readily recommend them to fellow musicians, something he does anyway. He says the next step is an endorsement deal. So there's like a a good example. They use that company's microphone. The company puts, hey, here's a sound clip of a band using our microphone. Yeah. Here's a podcast of uh, uh, podcasters using (laughs) SM57s. Podcasters with podcasters not using pop filters. (laughs) Not using pop filters. (laughs) At least two of us. We won't tell you who those are. (laughs) It's a blind test. (laughs) (laughs) Then we got an email that was really cool. I wanted to share um and then we'll close things out he says hey my name is christopher bell i have a comment regarding two of your episodes episode 28 where you talked about gas prices and episode 41 about having a story in the fall of 2007 i had just finished my u.s tour gas prices were starting to rise and i wanted to do something that would combine touring sustainability a summer outdoors and increased publicity 
I have, had already heard of people biking and walking for tours and wanted to do something different. So as a joke, I suggested to a friend that I was thinking of touring by canoe. He saw more possibility in it than I did at the time and convinced me to check it out. Within a day, I had already started researching and planning and deciding. Sure enough, next summer gas prices reached their peak and I had a tour booked from Buffalo to New York on the Erie Canal and Hudson River. Whoa. Wow. And to my surprise, the... <laughs> to your surprise. Yeah, it was just an earthquake. Some, yeah, somebody just smashed into the wall outside. <laughs> So, and to my surprise, press liked it more than I could have ever dreamed being picked up by NPR, the New York Times, and even CBS Evening News. Proof that all it takes is a good idea and a little hard work. And I asked him, you know, besides the press, how, how did it turn out, you know, as far as like how many, you obviously can't play very many shows going down the Hudson River. Right. But uh, he said... Hey, Kevin, great to hear back from you. It didn't seem too hard. As far as touring goes, it was pretty easy. Can't get lost. Places to camp every night. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible to get a speeding or parking ticket, and all you have to worry about is the weather. I did see quite a bump in sales and attendance for shows for a while, and I still get people coming up two years later asking if I was the canoe guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a memorable tour as well. Yeah, it is. So obviously you're not going to work with a rock band. But I uh, wonder. I was just yeah. thinking. I wonder if I could do that with a nine-piece band. Nine canoes. Well, you just have to have little instruments: ukuleles, flutes. Because we do have some canoes. Actually, a couple of my uh, couple of my bandmates are really into canoeing. So, mm. so yes, you can email us your cool stories at info at cdbabypodcast dot com. And uh, or leave comments at the website at cdbabypodcast.com and we might just share it on the show. But those were that was a cool story and useful comment by Darren as well. Um, so yeah, still got time to plan that canoe trip this summer. <laughs> the Columbia River, yeah, yeah. Here, and you got the Columbia Tour River the and Columbia. the Willamette River. That's that covers there's half of the Northwest. There's a few giant dams in the way though. No, there's a there's a lock to get around it. They let the canoes go through the locks. Well, at that point, you might just have to pick it up and carry it around. <laughs> <laughs> All right, unless you guys have something else interesting, tidbit, you want to share? Yeah. Big plans with your music? Um, let's see. Well, I'm, I'm working on a recording. Oh, yeah, we're both working on recordings. We're both working on recordings. Cool. <laughs> that was a neat story. Not as intriguing as the canoe story, but neat just the same. I did that hot yoga for the first time last night, too. It was 116 degrees, and it's Whoa. an hour and a half class. So I think, basically, I'm just running on total spirit right now, yeah. Wow. I would love that. A room at 116 degrees. I'm always cold.